Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the CBUS Paranormal Paracast. I'm your host, Jonathan Robson, and unfortunately, I have some bad news for those of you that haven't heard by now. On May 6, 2023, our team lost one of our own, a close friend, a teammate, a brother, and one of our founding members. Sadly, Michael Hale lost his fight and passed away after a long battle of dealing with several medical complications. Most of our listeners know that Mike had a kidney transplant in early 2022, and we all hoped that most of his problems were finally behind him. Unfortunately, Mike found himself in and out of hospital several times after the surgery, and his medical issues started becoming more complicated afterwards. Today's episode was originally supposed to focus on the 1912 Dresden train wreck, But due to the present situation, that episode will now be airing at a later date. On this month's episode, we're going to be paying tribute and our respects to our good friend and teammate, Michael Hale. I'm honestly not sure how long this episode's going to be, and I'm going to try to keep myself together. I'm not a person that normally handles stress or emotions well at times. And while for the most part, I can act like I'm okay, I'd be lying if I said I'm currently alright right now. This wound is obviously still very fresh in my mind, and this loss is going to take some time for me to heal from. And in my natural fashion, I'll likely be trying to keep myself as busy as possible in the meantime to help keep my mind off of things for a while. I'm going to try to do my best to summarize Mike and I's friendship, what he meant to me, and to also describe what he meant to our various projects that we worked on together over the years. Obviously, I'm extremely heartbroken for Mike's family and his inner circle of friends, and I'll try to do him justice on this episode. Mike certainly meant a hell of a lot to me, as he did for all of you. As most of you know, Mike and I reformed the CBUS Paranormal team at the start of 2022, and well, we had a lot of big plans on the table that we were hoping to accomplish upon our return, including this podcast that you're currently listening to. The original plan of the show was to have two hosts, and Mike was going to be a little bit of a counterbalance to my skepticism. (laughs) While he was skeptical in his own right, he also had his own thoughts and experiences over the years, and he also had numerous medical scares that reinforced his own beliefs. He was a little bit more, we'll say, spiritual in nature. While he never had a chance to officially host an episode, his footprint and his ideas have been all over the show since the beginning, and it wouldn't be where it's at today without him. In fact, it was Mike that wanted to expand our team into the cryptid field, and he also wanted to branch out and cover other aspects of the paranormal. Without these ideas and our late-night online conversations, a lot of the episodes that have previously aired would have never happened, and I certainly have Mike to thank for opening up my mind into these new possibilities. I'm going to start off this episode talking about how Mike and I first met, and oddly enough, it had nothing to do with the paranormal field. Our story is going to take us way back to the summer of 2008. At the time, I was still writing and playing guitar in my band called Black and Dawn, and we had quite a few shows lined up, but we were having a lot of problems with consistency from our bass player position. Certainly not from a performance aspect, but from a reliability standpoint, and it was obvious that something had to be done to rectify the issue. I would eventually place an advertisement on MySpace, and I got a message from a 20-year-old kid named Michael Hale out of Shelby, Ohio. Apparently, he had been playing bass in another project at the time, and was looking to see if he would be a fit in our project. Of course, my first thought was, where the hell is Shelby, Ohio? (laughs) Honestly, I had never heard of the town at this point. But in the days of MapQuest, look it up, kids, I would eventually learn to know it well and get lost over there quite a few times over the next few years picking him up and dropping him off. (laughs) As I've gotten older, I've started to understand that my memory isn't exactly the greatest at times, and I can't remember if I went to his house first or if he met us at the old practice room. I believe he came to us first, but personality-wise, I knew he'd be a fit. He really wanted to be involved with the project, and he was willing to learn on the fly. 
which considering our rather crazy music and lifestyle at the time, it would be a necessity, as well as a challenge. It didn't help that all of our band members also had their own unique personalities and characteristics that could also prove to be challenging to deal with at times, myself included. For those of you that don't know, our band Black and Dawn was a death metal band. Yeah, you know. High-speed time signatures, cookie monster vocals, disturbing lyrics, and we certainly want to destroy every town we played in. (laughs) Which at times can also lead to some pretty hefty bar tabs. At this point in our history, we were fairly well established in the local scene, and we already played with several national acts, just released our first EP, and had played several shows all over Ohio. And here we were, asking this kid to come along for the ride. He only had a few weeks to prepare for his first show. And that show, well, it wasn't a big deal. It would only be a date on a national tour called Death by Decibels, headlined by Cataclysm and Dying Fetus in 2008. (laughs) Fairly big names for our music genre. So yeah, it wasn't an easy first gig by any means, but Mike was certainly up for the task. One of my favorite memories from that show included the transportation that we used to get there. At the time, our band van had broken down which seemed to happen rather frequently, and we wasn't sure how we'd get up to Cleveland at that point. Lo and behold, our new bass player offered to load up his truck with our gear, ignoring its various mechanical flaws. It was also rusting out and had about five different colors of parts on it, (laughs) but it was also transportation that we desperately needed. So we all decided to go with it, and we drove that baby up to Cleveland at about 45 miles per hour, (laughs) at times fearing for our lives on the way there. For the Death by Decibel tour, Cataclysm had secured a sponsorship with a video game called Sacred 2 Fallen Angel, and they had the most decked out tour bus any of us had ever seen. The graphics on the sides were from the game, and they were truly awe-inspiring to everybody that's seen it. Literally, people were stopping in the middle of the road to try to get photos of it. And naturally, we parked our decked out hot rod right next to it. <laughs> Which was a great comparison for how much national bands were making at the time, compared to the local bands. Thankfully, we survived the gig, the trip, and arrived home in one piece the following morning. At the time, and until recently, I thought Mike was around my age. But apparently, he still wasn't even old enough to be in some of the bars we were playing in. (laughs) Well played, Mikey. Mike would go on to play a few shows and festivals with us in 2008 and 2009. He would also make an appearance on our self-titled album a few years later. There were a few funny moments that occurred during that time period including when we opened up a show on the second day of a hippie festival, unannounced, at around 7 (laughs) a.m. Just take a moment to picture the nice Hocking Hills nature background, Athens-type scenery in the middle of nowhere, everybody's asleep, and then a rubber chicken screeches across the PA for an unexpected wake-up call, (laughs) followed by a brutal onslaught of death metal and an unexpected three-song set list. Yeah. It was fun, (laughs) and hilarious at the same time, that's for sure. There were also some other odd occurrences that weekend involving grass monsters, sharks on golf carts, and hot dogs. But that is some band insider information that we won't get into on here. (laughs) Eventually, our original bass player would come back into the fold due to various scheduling conflicts and necessity at the time. But Mike was always just an email away if we needed him. I'll always be thankful for that. And honestly, if anything, I feel like his contributions as a bass player for the project were extremely underrated and overlooked, especially considering how young he was at the time. He was thrown right into the fire, and he had to adapt rather quickly. And honestly, he did a hell of a job in such a short time period. The band would continue playing shows until about mid-2012. At that point, we were beyond burnout, and the project's internal workings, myself included, simply started to unravel. I think our lifestyle choices, partying, and personal issues just finally caught up with us. While Mike was still around, for the most part he stayed clear of the chaos. Personally for me, it was just a chaotic time period in my life, but at the same time I think it helped develop me into who I am today. At that point, I walked away from the music scene with some new goals in mind. Try to finally settle down and start a family, and well... Try to find my next project. (laughs) There was always something waiting in the wings. And naturally, my buddy Mike would be right there and ready for the next adventure. And as much as we tried to escape the music scene, it just wasn't quite done with us yet at that point. 
Eventually, we would join up with our buddy Ryan from Seabus Productions, and we started filming local bands for a webcast while doing various skits and challenges. I remember at one point we tried to tackle a food challenge at Johnny Biggs in Mansfield, Ohio, called the Big Boss Challenge, which included a Goliath Monster hamburger and five pounds of food. And as to be expected, we all failed miserably. <laughs> but it was another fond memory that I still have from those days. As I've stated before on the Paracast, eventually paranormal skits and segments were filmed for our local music show at the Reformatory in Mansfield in 2011. And after that experience with Ryan, and always having an interest in the paranormal, I knew that I wanted to pursue the field further. And lo and behold, Mikey was all in as well. So our first official team investigation would happen in November of that year, and I was joined by Mike and Andrew for the beginning of our latest project and adventures. Here's a short clip we recorded a while back of him explaining how he got into the paranormal field. Hey guys, it's Michael, and I wanted to let you know a little bit about how I got into the paranormal field. When I was eight, I wound up in the hospital with a blood sugar that was a little over 1100, found out I had type 1 diabetes. After that, I'd start getting into stuff like Wicca and learning Buddhism and everything, which would help me cope with my hardships. And then when I was 15, I found out I had cancer and went through three years of chemo, during which I would have some weird experiences in the hospitals and at places like the hotel, and further strengthened my need to want to see if there was life after death. After that, like John said, I got into his band and we used to talk about paranormal stuff all the time. And then after the band decided to disband and everything, we decided to start Seabus Paranormal. Ever since then, we've been looking for anything out there. We're very skeptical on things, but, you know, in the end, it would be cool to see if there was actually something out there. And it would personally help me. While I was always interested in digging into the history and story aspect of the paranormal, Mike was always more of a tech geek. And I mean that in the best way possible. It wasn't uncommon for Mike to send me new device ideas and locations that he wanted to investigate. We'd often send each other late night messages, plotting the latest locations, gear, and whatever else we were thinking about at the time. In fact, Mike was one of the first people I seen trying to use the Kinect for paranormal investigations. While we now know that the Kinect is completely flawed for this field, at the time it was brand new technology, and he put that thing through several tests and experiments to test its accuracy. <laughs> this entire field is theory-based, and while we didn't always agree with the latest gadgets, we certainly wanted to keep on top of things to make sure we at least had access to test all of those devices and the reliability. When I think of investigations with Mike, I have a few that I'll always remember above the rest the Post Town Elementary School investigations, and also the Waverly Hills Sanatorium investigation. It wasn't uncommon for Andrew and Mike to stay at my house on the weekends back in those days, and I remember how excited we were to go to Waverly Hills for the first time. I naturally didn't get any sleep the night before, and Mike and Drew were starting to get delirious after the long travel and the wait in the hotel room. It was just one of those bucket list locations that we all wanted to go to, and we finally made it there. I think at that point we all truly felt that we arrived as a team, and it was certainly a special occasion for all of us, and we felt that this was a big moment for our team in general. I mentioned the Post Town Elementary School because it was the location of our first shadow figure that we ever caught on video. It was another one of those what-in-the-world moments when the experience happened, and again later when we reviewed the video to see exactly what had transpired. That night it appeared that pure dumb luck was on our side as we were conducting a strobe light test in a room that was reported to have a lot of activity. We crossed the hallway diagonally into another room when a random object was thrown at us through the doorway. We all heard the sound of something bouncing across the floor, and we turned the lights on, and we narrowed it down to a metal screw that appeared mysteriously on the floor in front of us. Upon our video evidence review the following week, I was looking for the object that was thrown on video, and I located it and watched it bounce into the frame. So naturally, my first reaction was, what in the hell is that? And then I started watching the doorway and seeing a four-foot-tall shadow figure standing in the doorframe. It appeared to be blocking out the strobe light in the background, and it appeared to move with each flash in the doorframe until it was no longer visible. 
We also had DVR cameras running in the hallway and knew that there was nobody out there. So after trying everything I could at the time to come up with a logical explanation, I finally gave in and showed Mike and Andrew. (laughs) And I think out of all of our investigations, that was the weirdest experience we ever had. Mike and I revisited this clip in 2021 as we were planning for the team's return, and it still seems to stand up to the test of time. It was weird occurrences like that that helped keep our interest in the field for years to come. Our next trip to Post Town was fun for non-paranormal reasons. During the night, a wrestling ring was set up in the middle of the gym, and we were allowed to have our own makeshift matchup. Jay Lynch's son, Hunter, was in the ring with us, and he was a referee that didn't quite call things down the middle. (laughs) I might have paid him off. I just remember hitting the ropes for the first time and trying to drop a Hulk Hogan-like leg drop in the center of the ring, and to my dismay, I found out how hard those rings really are, and it took me a minute to get up. (laughs) Mike and I would have a quick impromptu brawl, and I scored the victory after one of the worst-looking moves in the history of wrestling, but it was a blast. And after the match was over, I also didn't waste my opportunity to hit him again with the trash can lid. (laughs) So when it came down to it, Mike and I never had a problem goofing around when the time called for it. Our friendship always just had a dynamic chemistry, and as seriously as we took investigating, We had a lot of fun as well on the road when we had a chance. Here is another clip that Mike and I had recorded discussing some of our favorite locations to investigate. Mine's kind of a two different part answer. I'd say for the personal experience, it'd have to be Waverly. Uh, Just the history there. It's just a great place to go. Also, I did like the gift shop. Um... As for evidence-wise, you know, we used to talk about that a lot, where smaller locations would actually give us more. And I think I have a tie for uh, OSR and Prospect Place, which OSR is a bigger one, but Prospect, you know all about that. Yeah, Waverly was a really cool investigation. Uh, That was one of our bucket list locations. So when we finally got in there, it was pretty surreal. And to be able to explore the history of that place was amazing. Uh, We also got to disprove a couple things like Timmy's ball movement and uh, things of that nature in there. Uh, Smaller locations are really nice as well, usually, just because you have more time to investigate. And depending on where the location is, sometimes it's less outside contamination and other things we have to deal with on a case. As far as my favorite location, that's kind of a challenge. Um, As far as the historical importance, uh, Gettysburg was pretty cool. We got to run thermal between uh, Little Round Top and Devil's Den. You can just feel something there. It's uh, whether you want to call it energy or importance. It's just an amazing experience to know we were the only ones in the park that night. And you just feel the sense of importance of that land. Evidence-wise, it's a bit of a toss-up. Prospects always gave us some good stuff. Villisca, it was a challenging but interesting investigation. And, of course, the Ohio State Reformatories also uh, usually provides some form of evidence when we go there. As far as my favorite location, I'd probably have to say the Villisca Axe Murder House. I mean, it was quite the challenge to get out there. But as far as the history of the house, the location, I've always been into true crime and such as well. Um, I just really wish somebody would finally crack that case. And I've read up on it quite a bit over the years. And it's just, it was a place I always wanted to go. Um, For historical significance aspect, it was definitely one of my favorites. Large locations, you have plenty of ground to cover. A lot of obstacles, depending on where you're at in town, you may be dealing with outside noise, uh, that type of thing. The the smaller locations sometimes can be out in the middle of nowhere, and those are kind of appealing from an evidence review point. Yeah, I think it goes back to like what I was saying with the smaller locations. It seems like we always got more. I think uh, the first time we went to Prospect, was it like Road 666 or something like that we were going down to find it? Yeah, we got lost on uh, State Route 666 for a while. It leads into town. <laughs> uh, but once you pull up to the mansion, you kind of had that movie feeling. It was really kind of dark and dreary that night. It was in November. Um, it's just It seemed like you was just pulling into a movie for the investigation. Oh, yeah, definitely movie set movie feeling because uh, I think we were like, what, November? So everything's falling, everything's dying, just the way it looked, the lighting, 
I, I think I said something about that too. I was like, we don't got to worry about lighting. Look at this. As I previously stated, it wasn't uncommon for Mike and Andrew to hang out at my house back in the day on the weekends. They would often come over, help with evidence review, occasionally drink, and play a lot of Wii Bowling and Rock Band. And to anyone that knows Mike, knows that he would scour the internet and YouTube to find some of the weirdest songs and clips out there. <laughs> so naturally, there were a lot of random funny videos and karaoke moments at the house and traveling the locations. Eventually, I think Mike started having some paranormal burnout after a few years, and we sort of went our own separate ways. During that time period, we both started our own families and had kids, and Jeff Cole came onto the team, and we started our triathlon of investigations for our upcoming book release. Then Prospect Place Mansion was eventually dropped on Jeff and I in 2017, and things just kept getting busier and busier with each passing year. While Mike and I didn't completely lose contact with each other, our contact sessions were certainly more limited during those couple of years. Eventually, I ended up receiving an email from Mike asking about one of our Prospect Place Arts and Craft Show fundraisers that we held at the mansion each year, and he wanted to reserve a spot for himself and his wife Liz. I was thrilled to hear from Mike, and we finally reunited at that event. It was fun reconnecting, trading stories, and seeing how he was doing after all that time. The photo that I recently posted on Facebook was from that event. Jeff and I were wearing those god-awful safety vests, and we all posed for a photo for old time's sake. I remember Mike taking his kids around the mansion to show them how spooky the house was, and he was telling them some of the ghost stories from our prior investigations. <laughs> I also remember at the time Mike told me, if I ever get back into doing things again, to let him know. And I did that about a year and a half later. As most of you guys know, I retired from my Prospect Place board member position toward the end of 2021, and that itch to do something returned. After I visited Mike's Facebook page, I seen he'd recently been hospitalized, and I reached out to him. Unfortunately, Facebook loves to hide post, and I didn't realize he was having some problems around that time period. Apparently, at that point, he was home again, and we started talking about some of our past projects, and that's when I took my opportunity. So I'm starting a team back up. You want in? <laughs> and naturally he was in and we were off just like old times. We had several late night conversations and we started planning out the podcast and naturally he was full of ideas on ways to expand it. It was Mike that explained to me what TikTok was and why we needed to use it. And he also provided other valuable insights. We ended up booking a return investigation for Landel's Mohican Castle in January of 2022 and we had a blast hanging out again and investigating. During that night, he started talking about his medical situation, and he explained to me how he was on a waiting list for a kidney transplant, and that they could literally call him at any point for surgery. So we both agreed that we'd investigate locations close to home until the surgery was completed. Everything seemed to be moving in a positive direction, but sadly, things started to go downhill from there. Unfortunately, we didn't know it at the time, but this would end up being our last investigation together. Naturally, we had a few funny John and Mike moments, such as bouncing TV remote beams off of glass from other rooms to simulate and disprove a possible claim of haunting. <laughs> and it certainly felt like old times. It was good to have my buddy back. We started preparing for our appearance at last year's Marietta Paranormal Exposition Convention. Mike finally got his long-awaited call the day before, and he was rushed to surgery. I distinctly remember him trying to apologize about having to miss the convention, and I was like, dude, get that taken care of, that's great news. You have bigger things to worry about, man. Mike would eventually come out of surgery obviously sore, but it seemed like everyone was fairly positive about his recovery. At this point in his life, Mike had survived cancer in his younger years, he was diagnosed as being diabetic around the age of eight, and everyone was hoping this would fix a lot of the issues he was having. Unfortunately, there were a lot of ups and downs from there, and it seemed like he was constantly in and out of the hospital for most of 2022. I obviously didn't want to push him or try to get him back into the fold until he was absolutely ready. So that explains why I did quite a few solo adventures and investigations on our first year back as a team. If I sent him a message on Facebook and I didn't hear back within a day or two, I knew something was up, and thankfully his wife Liz Hale kept everybody up to date with what was happening every step of the way. 
So that leads us to 2023. About mid-January, Mike and I started making plans for the new year. And for the first time in a while, he was starting to feel like he was ready to discuss locations. Eventually, we decided that we wanted to visit the Mothman bunkers in West Virginia for our next trip together. We started making plans to schedule it. A few days later, my wife and I traveled up to Cleveland to see Beetlejuice the Musical on January 24th, and we stopped at a nearby sushi restaurant before the show, and I was scanning through my phone, and Liz posted that Mike was on life support. And naturally, my nerves kicked in overdrive. I just had a sickening, sinking feeling in my stomach. It was obvious something major happened, and I was worried that this might be it for Mike. While I never said it out loud, I was certainly nervous about all the complications he was having. It seemed that his weakened immune system contracted chickenpox at some point, and unfortunately it put him back into the hospital, with devastating effects. Eventually, after a few weeks, Mike came out of his medically induced coma, and we found out that he also had a heart attack as well during that time period. He was unfortunately in rough shape, and it was clear that he would need a lot of therapy to get back on his feet and finally back home. Sadly, he never made it back home. Mike was transferred to Galleon to a nursing facility around March, and finally his family and friends had the chance to visit him again. I waited a week to make my first visit, and I wanted to make sure everybody had a chance to see him and let him get adjusted. He seemed in good spirits at the time, and was noticeably tired but hopeful. He was about to start his therapy sessions to learn how to walk again, and he was hopeful that things were going back in the right direction. From what Mike told me, he was having problems with one of his arms, and had lost a fair amount of weight. At that time, we were both hopeful that his weight would improve by the time of my next visit. On my second visit, we talked again for a good while. I was telling him about some of the recent investigations that I had been working on, and he was watching some sort of... Brooklyn meets Gordon Ramsay type restaurant rehab show when I came in. <laughs> so naturally, we watched it a bit and made fun of it. Again, he was in good spirits, but the weight issue wasn't improving, and his rehab seemingly stalled for the time being. On my third and final visit, I knew something sadly wasn't quite right. I remember walking in, visibly seeing his weight loss, and something told me this might be the last chance I had to talk to him. He was tired, and I could see the physical exhaustion on his face. I spent some extra time hanging out with him that day, and he was very alert to the conversation. Mike was mentally there until the very end, and I'm extremely thankful that we were able to reconnect over the last few years. Then I had a chance to visit with him on those last few days. I tried to keep the conversation as upbeat as I could, but I could tell he was in pain. The plan at that time was to try to clear up some of the infections that he had contracted, have surgery on his foot, and insert a feeding tube during the next week. When I left that day, I sat in my car in a parking lot, and I said to myself, I think that's my last conversation with Mike. And reality started to sink in, and sadly I was right. A week later, on May 6th, I woke up to a text message from Liz. And stated he was gone. And that sinking feeling once again returned. It's hard for me to explain how I felt at that moment. For over a year, I knew that this might eventually become a possibility. And yet at the same time, I felt emotionally unprepared for that moment. Mike always seemed to be a Rubik's Cube of health problems, but he always seemed to find a way to fight and move past them. Unfortunately, this time, his body finally gave out on him. His wife and daughter was with him at the time he passed. I attended the memorial the following week, and on February May 12th, helped him with his burial as a pallbearer. Said my final goodbye. It's one of the hardest moments of my life so far. I want to thank Liz and Mike's family for including me in this process. And I can't thank you all enough for updating your Facebook pages during Mike's struggles, keeping everybody posted. I assure you I was checking them every day. 
It was an honor to meet Mike's family, his brothers, his friends that I had heard about for so long. While it was extremely difficult to process, there were so many awesome stories and positive experiences about Mike that were being shared amongst those of us that knew him best. At this point, I'm going to read from Mike's obituary, and then I'm going to close the show with some final thoughts. James Michael Mike Hale, age 35, of Shelby, died Saturday, May 6, 2023. Still like medical in Columbus with his wife and daughter by his side. Although Mike fought a long, hard road with various health issues throughout his life, he constantly pushed and battled until the very end. Mike was born September 30th, 1987 in Shelby, to James Darrell and Tammy Susan Dawson Hale. Mike was a member of the Shelby High School class of 2007 and had taken several college courses online. He worked for various companies throughout his life when his health permitted, including being a welder for several years and working for Pepperidge Farm in Willard. Mike's hobbies were numerous, with aside from family his greatest love being music a metalhead through and through. His favorite bands were Tool, Pucifer, and A Perfect Circle, while also enjoying numerous other genres such as Dean Martin, 50s, classic rock, and many others. Playing his guitar brought him peace, and he also was in the band Black and Dawn. A true night owl, Mike often stayed up watching his favorite horror movies or TV shows. On the same theme, his podcast with his friend Jonathan called Seabus Paranormal focused on various haunted buildings and sites. Mike enjoyed being in nature, whether that be fishing or going for a hike, and loved to tinker in his garage. Although he was ornery, a constant practical joker, he was known to prank scare people. His kindness was obvious through the love of his family, especially his daughter, Chloe, who was the love of his life and could do no wrong. Mike is survived by his wife, Elizabeth Rose Liz Kingman Hale, High school sweethearts who rekindled their love 10 years later and married on December 10th, 2014. Also surviving are his children Isaac Porter and Chloe Hale. Parents Daryl and Tammy and brothers Nicholas Cody Kayla Hale and Gregory Allen Hale, both of Shelby. And I'm going to stop right there so I don't get anybody's names wrong because there's a lot of them here. But I do want to thank you guys for listing myself and Spencer under the best friends section of this. You guys are truly awesome. It was an honor to meet you guys at the memorial and the funeral. Thank you. So as you can tell, I'm having a hard time keeping myself together as this episode's coming to a close. I'm recording this a day after Mike's funeral, and I felt this is the least I could do for someone who I consider family. It's hard. I'm still going through about every emotion imaginable. Unfortunately, nothing is promised in this life or the next. Live your life to the fullest and always tell your loved ones that you love them, because you never know when it might be your last chance. Thankfully, I had that opportunity, and I did. Although we lost Mike at an extremely young age, he was able to accomplish quite a bit in his lifetime. Everyone lives their lives wanting to make a mark in the world or an impact, something that will be remembered for future generations. After attending Mike's memorial, and his funeral services and seeing the pure emotion and stories from his loved ones, I can guarantee that Mike left that mark on the world. His impact is going to be felt for a very long time to come. His family, his friends, his children, his teammates, his bandmates, his presence is still felt. As long as we continue to keep him in our hearts and our thoughts, he'll continue to live on in all of us. And while we're all grieving at this moment, Remember the great times we shared with Mike, the positive memories and the experiences. That's what truly keeps Mike alive with all of us, the memories. Without giving too many details, I'd be lying if I said I haven't felt something or someone with me after this week at times. And while it seems to come and go, I can't help to think he still might be checking in to see how things are going from time to time. Mike... Know that I'll always cherish the moments we had together, and I'm going to miss you more than you'll ever know. If death is a mere transition, I hope that we get to meet again someday. For now, I hope that wherever you are, you're at peace. I love you, brother.
Thank you for listening, everybody.